centuries, Sri Lanka was a kingdom ruled by its own monarchs. Agriculture, water irrigation, architectural infrastructure, and foreign trade flourished under the reign of the various famous and legendary kings who ruled the island. In 1505, when the Portuguese landed on Lanka's shores, this island was governed by multiple kingdoms. At the time, it was divided into four kingdoms, Kote the most important, Kandy in the mountains, and Jaffna in the north. Sri Lanka was known to the Portuguese then as Ceylao. Later, when the British arrived on the island, they simply transliterated Ceylao to English Ceylon. Portugal's interest in conquering Sri Lanka was mainly for three reasons. Number one, to secure control over the country's spices, especially the cinnamon trade. Number two, to carry out proselytizing activities or conversion activities in order to divert the religious allegiance of the natives to the Roman Catholic Church. And number three, to establish a firm political hold in the island so as to strategically position themselves as masters of the Indian Ocean region. Before arriving in Sri Lanka, the Portuguese arrived in India. The Muslim traders and sailors, being well aware of regional issues, knew about the troubles the Indian people were facing as a result of the Portuguese having landed there. Due to their constant traveling from country to country for the purposes of trade, these Muslim traders knew about the atrocities committed by the Portuguese in India. The Portuguese soldiers upon arrival were declared to Dharma Parakramabahu, the king of Kote, as a race of men exceedingly white and of comely withal. They don jackets and boots and hats of iron, rest not a minute in one place but walk here and there, they eat hunks of stone and drink blood. They give two or three pieces of gold and silver for one fish or one lime. They have guns that make a noise like thunder and even louder. And a ball shot from one of them, after flying some leagues, will break a castle of marble and even of iron and burst upon the rock of Yugandara. Needless to say, the contest between the Portuguese and the Moors was an unequal one. The Portuguese were trained and disciplined soldiers conversant with methods of warfare. Described by Samuel Huntington as organized crime, their ships were heavily equipped with cannons and other war weapons unheard of by the peaceful and industrious Moor. When the Portuguese captain Lorenco de Almeida led the fleet of ships into Colombo in 1505, they witnessed a number of Muslim ships anchored in the harbour loading and unloading cargo. From that eventful day, Arab and Moorish predominance along the coasts of Ceylon was doomed forever. Up to that time, the Moors held the favourable positions along the sea coast of Ceylon and since then they have never regained that distinction. These Muslim traders knew that Captain Lorenko's arrival spelled doom for Sri Lanka because they also knew that he was the son of the first Portuguese governor of Goa in India. Realizing the predicament not just of themselves but of the country, they strongly opposed the Portuguese presence here. However, the Portuguese persisted with their plans and won over the king of Kote. The Muslims appealed to the king not to let the Portuguese get a foothold in the island, which wise words have been captured for us by historian Paul E. Pires. The Moors, taught by terrible experience, watched this new development with anxiety and the deputation of their leading merchants waited on the king. In earnest words, they urged on him that he should not allow himself to be led astray by the flattering speeches of the governor, 
for their experience in India had already warned them not to trust the Portuguese. Their sole object was to aggrandize themselves at the expense of the countries which they visited, and too late the Sinhalese would find the sovereign power wrested from their grasp. They, the Muslims, emphasized their own good services to the people. None could deny that their trade had brought wealth and prosperity in its train. They had never interfered with the political affairs of the country, and they had not attempted to obtrude their religion on those who did not desire it. They prophesied that the arrival of the Portuguese would be followed by the downfall of the national religion. From this we learn about the regard and reverence the Muslims had for the Sinhalese and for Buddhism. We learn how they wanted to ensure that Sri Lanka continue to remain a Buddhist nation and that no force overrides it as national religion. They formed a delegation and visited the King of Kote and pleaded with him and warned him about the consequences Sri Lanka will face if the Portuguese were allowed to establish their presence here. In 1518, Lopo Soares de Albergueria, a Portuguese viceroy, came with orders from the King of Portugal to erect a fort in Sri Lanka. They named it Nossa Senhora das Virtudes, or Santa Barbara. This first fort was triangular in shape and was surmounted by a central tower. The Muslims solicited the support of the Sinhalese priests to rouse the people against the building of this fort. Historian Pauli Pires writes, The vehement expostulations of the Moors who also received sympathetic support from the Sinhalese priests, roused the people into a frenzy, and in spite of the strict instructions of the king, the city was soon in an uproar. The excitement spread to Colombo, some Portuguese who had ventured on land were seized, and a stockade erected to prevent the occupation of the spot Soares had selected as the site for his fort. The Moors instigated the people and tried to prevent them from supplying provisions to the Portuguese. Firearms were supplied and the ships of the Portuguese were attacked, but the fort was erected in defiance of the Muslims and the Sri Lankan people. Dr. Lona Devaraja writes, The Muslims prevailed upon all sections of Sinhala society and did their utmost to prevent the construction. They warned the king of Kote that his sovereignty would soon be diluted for the sole objective of the Portuguese was territorial aggrandizement. They reminded the court and the nobility of their own good services to the country, of the wealth and prosperity they had brought it, and of their unswerving loyalty to the crown. The Sangha was forewarned of the potential threat to the national religion, for the extermination of other faiths was the foundation of Portuguese rule. Following the construction of this fort in Colombo, the Muslims and the Sinhalese united in calling for its deconstruction, and ultimately in 1524, resulting from the joint insistence of both communities, the Portuguese dismantled the fort.